We are preparing to go live on uh, YouTube at Music LW. We are live here at, here it is. So our YouTube just came up, Music LW. We are here live on Facebook, Deidre Davis ESQ. And we are going to do a presentation. We have a small contest competition going. And we have team one and team two. Team one, we did a presentation yesterday that we will redo because we are uh, learning technology. We're learning how to um, use all of the tools. And today we're going to have team two. Team two is called Team Focus. Team Focus will be um, presented to you by uh, Benjamin Jeffries. He'll tell you a little about himself and then we will proceed. So I am Judge Deidre Davis, Judge of the 270th District Court, and it is my honor and my privilege and my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Benjamin Jeffries, our future lawyer from South Texas College of Law, Houston. One moment, I have to figure out how to turn it. There mm -hmm. it is. And you can begin, sir. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Benjamin Jeffries. I'm a rising 3L at South Texas College of Law, Houston. And we're going to be discussing the rule 18.001 from the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code. But before we dive into that, I'd like to take a moment and thank my team. Uh, first, there's myself, Benjamin Jeffries, 3L, South Texas College of Law. Darren is a 1L at South Texas College of Law. Marissa and Stephanie Cooksey, both 2Ls at South Texas College of Law. Ariel Strong is from Thoroughgood Marshall School of Law, and she is a rising 2L. Eugenia Gutierrez Rodriguez and Frank Leaf are both 2Ls at South Texas College of Law. And that is going to bring us into rule 18.001 of the Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code uh, concerning affidavits concerning cost and necessity of services. So the way we're gonna address this, we're gonna, we're gonna first talk about the purpose of 18.001. We're gonna discuss the history. Uh, we're gonna address several changes that have been made recently and then give a quick summary. So what is the purpose of 18.001? Why do we need it? Why is it? something that's beneficial to everybody. It's a long-standing practice that under Texas law, in order for a plaintiff to, to recover damages that are costs that they've uh, encountered and cured, they have to prove that those uh, uh, costs are reasonable and necessary. Uh, so 18.001 provides a method to do that that is a procedural method its basic function is to streamline this process, which saves time and money for everybody. And there's very, very few situations where saving time and money is a bad thing. So 18.001, definitely a good thing. Quick history. Uh, in the beginning, when one had to prove the reasonableness and necessity of the cost that they have incurred, they would have to parade witnesses into the courtroom uh, or get a lot of depositions from expert witnesses or from the actual providers of the service. And when you add this to all the other components of litigation, it, it expanded the process, made for a more lengthy, cumbersome uh, experience in the courtroom. So this is something that the Texas State Legislature addressed in 1979, with the passing of Texas General Law 1778. Uh, what this did was allow the plaintiff to sidestep the expert witness testimony and eliminate bringing in all of these uh, uh, individual providers of services 
It replaced that with one affidavit that was filled out by the provider that stated at the time and place the service was rendered, it was reasonable. Now that could work towards proving the reasonableness and necessity of the, of the cost. 1778 also provided for a counter affidavit. And where 70, 1778 got, uh, where it had its speed bumps or where it fell short was the way this counter affidavit was treated. Once a counter affidavit was filed, the original claimant could no longer rely on the initial affidavit, uh, which basically reset everything to the way it was before. We're back to parading in witnesses uh, and providers. So instead of making the process a more expedient process, it actually added a step to it, making it more cumbersome. So we fast forward to 1987, and the answer to this problem is rule 18.001. It provides a method that allows the provider or the custodian of records for the provider to give an itemized list of services provided, what those services cost, the amount that they've been paid, and the amount that they're still owed. Uh, this this can work towards proving those costs. Uh, the 18.001 also allows for a counter affidavit to be used. And that counter affidavit can dispute some of or all of the initial affidavit. Uh, when the initial affidavit is submitted, if there is no counter affidavit, then it goes to proving the reasonableness and necessity of the charges that were incurred. What it does not do, 18.001 is very clear, mentioned it several times throughout the statute, that it does not work towards proving or disproving the causation of the injuries. It's only addressing the reasonableness and necessity of the services provided. So, a summary of the history is that it, originally we go from parading in the individual providers and the expert witnesses. 1778 gave us an affidavit, but that affidavit was rendered useless after a counter affidavit was introduced. And currently we have more of an affidavit versus counter affidavit system. Uh, and that's there's still situations where uh, the occasional expert witness may need to come in and testify to give some clarity to something, but the rule itself is, has come a long way in streamlining that process and saving time and money. So to address the counter affidavit specifically, what it has to have is it needs to give reasonable notice of what's being disputed. Um, it also needs to be filled out by someone who's qualified by knowledge, skill, experience, training, education, or other expertise. That language is very important because it, it almost mirrors the language from the Texas uh, Code of Civil Procedure for who can be qualified to be an expert witness. Is that exactly what it means or is maybe a little different? That's something that we're going to address through case law that uh, it's actually a very, very recent case that we're going to discuss in Ray Allstate. We're going to discuss that in, in just a bit. So the reasonableness, uh, reasonable notice. The reasonable notice is it shares a definition of fair notice from the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. And basically, if the person being served can ascertain the basic issues in question and gather what testimony needs to be relevant, then that serves as fair notice or reasonable notice. A couple of changes to 18.001. In 2019, there were some changes to the actual statute. Uh, these changes address the service and the time the affidavits had to be filed. The old way, pre-2019, was that the 
initial affidavit had to be filed 30 days prior to trial. And the counter affidavit needed to be filed 30 days after that was served. So that puts the defense filing the counter affidavit up to the eve of trial. That's not the best way to go about preparation. It doesn't give a lot of time for adjustments or planning or, uh, you know, it, ha it has its downside. And the new way in 2019, that was addressed. They've made the adjustment to where now the initial affidavit is to be filed 90 days after the defense has given uh, an answer. So once the defense answers the initial claim, uh, the claimant then has 90 days to file the affidavit. Or it has to be filed within or before the date that they have to uh, designate an expert witness. And that date's going to be uh, dictated by a court order or through the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. And it's whichever comes first. So those three options, the 90-day option, the uh, expert witness designation through court order or through uh, the Texas Code of Civil Procedure, whichever one comes first is where the affidavit has to be filed. Uh, definitely designed to expedite the process. Uh, now for the counter affidavit, where it was they could be filing it at the eve of trial, now it's 120 days past the point when they got their uh, notice. Or it shares the same qualifications of the initial affidavit where uh, they have to have it filed by the date the expert witnesses has to be designated. Same, same process, either through court order or through the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure. So what this does is add some efficiency to everything. It allows the claimant to have some time to put forth the, the proper documentation. It allows the defense proper time to evaluate those claims and formulate a defense against them uh, and know exactly what they're trying to dispute make sure everything's filed accordingly and uh, removes a lot of the suddenness and surprise that may come with files that happen uh, on the eve of trial. A case on point that's very relevant is NRA Allstate. This case was decided on May 7th, 2021 from the Texas Supreme Court and involved an injured motorist. That injured motorist had filed an 18.001 affidavit, uh, giving an itemized list of injuries and costs. The insurance company filed a counter affidavit challenging the initial affidavit. And uh, it was filled out by a nurse, a non-practicing nurse that did have a pretty substantial history, pretty substantial background in medical billing and coding. The, the, the claimant, the plaintiff, well, the judge in the case overruled the counter affidavit. The Court of Appeals upheld that decision and it ended up in the Texas Supreme Court. And what the Texas Supreme Court ruled is that a nurse with that type of experience, uh, even, even if it doesn't totally meet the, the traditional idea of what an expert witness would be if she has the appropriate or he has the appropriate experience in the particular field that they're talking about they can fill out this affidavit and, it, and it's totally okay uh, a couple other things that NRA Allstate talked about was the counter affidavit does serve as fair notice if the plaintiff can understand each uh each expense that's being attacked. So as long as they can ascertain which particular issues are being attacked, that's fine. That, that serves as a as fair, reasonable notice. The, uh, a couple other things that NRA Allstate addressed is 18.001 does not prohibit the defendant 
from introducing evidence at trial uh, to combat the reasonableness of charges. And what that means essentially is that they don't even have to file a counter affidavit. They can still introduce evidence to combat it, uh, to combat the initial claim of reasonableness. And uh, so those are some those are some recent clarifications and changes that have been given through statute and through case law. So in closing, what we've done is address the purpose of Rule 18.001, which is to streamline the efficiency in proving reasonableness and necessity of costs. We've talked about what the rule is uh, uh, clarifying and that the document requirements, service requirements, the counter affidavit and all the requirements that come with it. We've discussed the changes, the 2019 changes through legislature and uh, some clarification that's been given to us through in Ray Allstate. Uh, and that, that concludes my message on 18.001. I would like to take one more moment to thank my team. They, uh, we, we are team focused and myself is Benjamin Jeffries. I'm the presenter of 3L South Texas College of Law. I was helped without this. Uh, I, I am but the mouthpiece to everybody's efforts. And Marissa Cavallos, 2L South Texas College of Law. Stephanie Cooksey, 2L South Texas College of Law. Eugenia Gutierrez Rodriguez, also a 2L South Texas College of Law. Darren Adesanya, she's a 1L at South Texas College of Law. Ariel Strong is a rising 2L at Thoroughgood Marshall. And Frank Leaf, who is a rising 2L at South Texas College of Law. Thank you to them and thank you for, to you for your attention. Well, what we are going to do is stop this video. Uh, don't move because I'm learning how to do everything. But we are going to give more instructions on our contest. Um, we are uh, giving the uh, interns, lost, lost students that are three L's, an opportunity to um, express themselves, the opportunity to be in the courtroom. We're giving them an opportunity to um, once they're lawyers, we're trying to help them go from lawyers to litigators. So it is our goal that we have um, spectacular uh, counselors. We have a child abduction over here. On the <laughs> so that video ended. So thank you all for your attention. We're going to go ahead and stop the video. And we're going to go ahead and stop our YouTube.